With the recent streaming era and music cutting profits for major record labels due to abysmal payouts per listen, it is no secret labels are scrambling to recoup losses and optimize return on investments anywhere they can find. Not to mention, technology has opened the floodgates for amateur artists to compete with A-list musicians from recording in their bedrooms, and thus, competition has never been so brutal. Record labels needed a foolproof way with little to no overhead costs to make ends meet. Unfortunately, posthumous albums have risen to popularity to fill this void, and worse yet, have been exploited because of how efficient they are in generating revenue. When it's through recent deceased mega artists like Juice World, XXXTentacion, Mac Miller, Pop Smoke, and more. Although there is demand for the music by fans after the lives of these artists tragically ended, record labels have certainly gone too far. For those unaware about what exactly a posthumous album is, it is an album consisting of previously recorded material while the artist was obviously alive, but released after their death, raising many ethical and moral concerns as to if they would have actually wanted to release said music to the world in the first place, given they were not present to approve its release. In the current music landscape, many times, musicians record hundreds or even thousands of songs with no intention of releasing a far majority of the tracks. The largest proponent of posthumous music in recent years has unequivocally been Juice World's label, that has thus far released nine or so official projects and or singles in total since his passing in late 2019. Somehow, not even scratching the surface of the sheer amount of tracks he recorded in his short duration as a label signee to Interscope and Grade A Productions. It is said there are still thousands of songs that his label doesn't even know about, locked in hard drives of recording studios around the world, known only to his leak community and private buyers of the music. In fact, a few of the official posthumous releases were essentially scalped or discovered by fans sent to the label to release to the public because they performed so well on SoundCloud and YouTube archive pages. But there lies the problem, the distinction between business and art. No one can deny the success of the Juice World posthumous albums, such as Legends Never Die selling upwards of roughly 500,000 copies within its first week, or any of the projects that followed in the years after. But honestly, with the trajectory of Juice World's career in general, coming off a top 10 billboard hit with Lucid Dreams, any music he released would have reached mainstream heights in all likelihood. Perhaps not to that level just yet, but eventually. He was just that talented of an artist. Once again though, we must ask ourselves, did Juice World intend to release these heartfelt moments and dedicated songs to his fiance at the time for everyone on this planet to hear and not receive any of the benefits? But how is this all possible? Shouldn't all access to an artist catalog be legally void upon their death? I mean, the whole agreement between the artist and a record label is essentially a partnership, wherein they both receive a share in the revenue for each bringing resources to the table. The artist, the music, the label, the marketing and infrastructure. Well, the lengthy contracts that artists sign at the beginning of their careers, commonly deemed as slave agreements, are even worse than we thought. For the contractual agreements actually exceed the lifespan of the artist in many cases, and therefore labels can still utilize the artist's name and likeness as a tool without their consent if they are out of the picture, inherently holding more power since there is less pushback. Within reason, of course. For one hot topic in the music industry as fans and artists alike have become more aware of is the concept of owning your masters, or master recordings. In simple terms, who actually owns the music, not just the royalty splits. And typically, labels end up with the most control of this due to their insurmountable leverage over artists eager to jumpstart their careers with little resources so early when they sign. And not to say this is necessarily a bad thing always, because that's just business. Business relationships are always give and take based on what you can bring to the table at the time of negotiation. But in regards to posthumous albums and releases, it's a taboo subject, because one can never really predict when or how their life will be taken. Or can they? See, record labels have actually accounted for such an occurrence through actuary calculations, and in some cases, encouraged it, at least through negligence. For most record contracts consist of a non-performance or failure of performance clause that assures the label will recoup all their money if you cannot perform, or in other words, if you die. Some examples include the following. Companies shall have the right to secure insurance equivalent to 10 times the estimated value of the artist's earnings from any source of revenue for company's sole benefit. Companies shall be allowed to employ any insurance carrier or combination of same to assure this benefit and need not consult or require signature compliance from artists. Companies shall keep such information confidential except that company may disclose such information to the applicable insurance carriers or as required by law. 
artist or artist estate shall have no right to review or claim the benefit of any such policy obtained by a company. Spooky stuff, to say the least. In layman's terms, the culmination of these clauses essentially explains that the record label has the right to take out a life insurance policy up to 10 times the estimated artist's earnings from performances, streams, everything, without the artist's consent or even knowing whatsoever, and of which the artist family has no right to collect any portion. Now, as with everything we cover in videos, there is a bit of nuance. The family or artist estate may also purchase their own life insurance policy to mitigate their losses. And of course, a business is smart to insure one of their quote, assets, aka the artists and their music, because if they do pass away before the contract ends, which has happened too frequently in recent times to not account for, the label could be left at a massive loss, considering the sizes of advances given to artists nowadays. But at the same time, it almost incentivizes the label to, let's say, extinguish the artist's life. or allow the artists to do it themselves. Match this motivation with the reckless lifestyles of rappers commonly participating in gang culture, drug abuse, among other degeneracy, and the label can make a pretty solid return on investment without doing much work. In many cases, a better return than if they remained alive throughout the duration of the contract. Now, we reviewed a couple of these scenarios in a past video, but one particular artist outlines this concept perfectly. In the 1990s, one rapper by the name of Bushwick Bill sued his label Rap-A-Lot Records for attempting to exercise this life insurance policy purposely. He alleged that, unbeknownst to him, his label created a life insurance policy with themselves as the beneficiary, which at the time was justified given that he already lost an eye during a firearm-related altercation with a past girlfriend, but later on, knowing his affiliation with violent street activities, sent a hit out on him at a Houston nightclub so the insurance policy would pay out the hefty death benefit. Unfortunately for the label, he survived. But if the plan were to have gone accordingly, it would not have been that suspicious considering his gangster rap lifestyle and lyrics. It was the perfect crime. Not only would the label receive regular payouts for his current catalog of music and posthumous releases, but also the insurance policy. It's a win-win-win. Not so different than mafia activities we see in movies, when they would deliberately insure a vacant building and demolish or burn it down in order to cash out the policy. So as you can see, as much as social media gives fans and labels a glimpse into their self-destructive lifestyles filled with violent crimes, being targeted, drug abuse, and suicide, it is actually in their best interest, at least financially, to encourage it. In the case of Juice World, there are even videos of Lil Bibby, Grade A Productions co-owner, handing him Percocets at the studio early in his career. Of course, it would definitely be a bit harsh to assume Lil Bibby was attempting his own schemes, especially given he was a rapper years ago and participates in the same antics, but you cannot deny with how things turned out for Juice that he has not benefited greatly financially. Not to mention, the phenomenon by which when a rapper passes away or is arrested, it's the ultimate form of free marketing. Cable news, articles, tweets, and the like spread everywhere instantly due to the sensationalized headlines. To Juice World's friends and family, this is a living hell, being reminded anywhere they go that they just lost a loved one. But to the label, this is a blessing in disguise. In fact, with only 24 hours of his death, Juice World gained over 3 million followers. Combine this with the current fan base listening to his music as a commemoration on repeat all day on streaming platforms, as well as new listeners who had no idea who he was prior to the viral headlines checking out what all the fuss is about, and the label has a viable marketing strategy to multiply their revenue with virtually no budget. The media did it all for them especially when they follow it up months later with an album title that draws on the fans emotions like legends never die and memorabilia to pay respects to their idol for like 50 to 100 dollars a pop for reference this first posthumous album nearly tripled the sales of its predecessor while still alive and don't get the wrong idea i don't necessarily think this is the worst thing in the world because some of it does have its place to help the fans cope with such a traumatizing event but there is a line and as aforementioned, the posthumous releases have shown no signs of stopping, especially when the startup costs and overall risk to launch a new artist to the same level as an already proven artist is ever so increasing. It only makes sense, at least at a business level. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. 
and that fans have caught on to the label's solely business motivations, showcased by the receding sales of every posthumous release that follows the first. Juice World's Fighting Demons album still sold more than most current mainstream artists in its first week, but performed worse than his sophomore album while still alive, Death Race for Love. The same holds true with XXX Tentacion's Skins and Bad Vibes Forever albums following his death, including endless backlash from fans concerned with maintaining the artist's legacies. For most of the songs were unfinished and or greatly altered with the addition of features and over-engineering that the artist never intended. After all, why milk more of the artist's unfinished discography if it was already intact as it was? Not to mention, already accruing millions of dollars every year from the current catalog. Perhaps in the future, labels will take heed of this diminishing return and come to their senses morally, for their strategy may not be as effective as it once was. Fans are just too smart for that. I mean, why would they listen to the music that for all intents and purposes is not even from that artist? One label that should be modeled after was Mac Miller's, in that they did proceed with releasing the album he was working on prior to his death, but left it at just that. Circles was critically acclaimed upon its release and even more appreciated by the fans for adhering to a strict ethical code, merely releasing what the artists had intended in the first place. Even artists are resisting posthumous albums at this point, such as Lil Uzi Vert, who revealed his apprehensions with working with XXX Tentacion, among other deceased artists, out of respect on one of Aiden Ross's live streams. Uzi, what are your thoughts on Ja XXX Tentacion, and what is your favorite song by X? And do you plan on hopping on an unreleased X track because Ja really wanted to collab with you, and everyone on XS team really wants it to happen? XXX Tentacion Uzi song PLS. Yes, I would love to do a song with him, but. I'm really weird on stuff like that. Don't get me wrong, it took me really long to do that before with another artist. I'm really weird because I understand that they're not here living, and what if that's not the vision that they really want? Although he and Juice World did in fact release the Lucid Dreams remix years after his death, but the track had already been completed for years prior, in a way still holding true to his morals. More recently, Tyler the Creator explained during a live performance that he wrote in his will that his music cannot be released after his death, even with the thousands of unreleased tracks he likely has stored in hard drives. Some of these are so good, I can't oh. just let it sit on my hard drive because I have in my will no. that if I die, no one they can can't put no fucking post out. Yeah, that's like, Some random feature on it, some nigga I didn't fuck with. Like, you go. I'm like, no. So, even if his current contract includes a death clause of sorts, by which the label holds the rights to release music posthumously, they simply cannot, legally. Something to note though, is it's not entirely the label's fault, in that while they do have the ability to release said music, it still needs to be approved by whoever is in charge of their estate, most of the time their parents or family members. Therefore, he is more so revoking his estate's ability to sign off on further music, something that he felt needed to be done given how past deceased artists' estates have handled their discography, such as the late XXX Tentacion, whom Tyler actually referenced indirectly in the previous clip if you listen closely. By releasing countless remixes and unnecessary collaborations X had never even met while still alive. The battle against posthumous albums isn't totally over though. In fact, in my opinion, it has only just begun. With the emergence of artificial intelligence replicating alive and deceased artist voices almost perfectly, I believe it will only increase the amount of posthumous singles and albums due to virtually no limitations in creating an infinite supply of music in the future. Legendary producer Timbaland has already commenced plans to commercialize AI software that gives producers exclusive rights to use the voice of a music legend who's no longer with us. I'm going to lead the way, he said, in the pursuit of producing a track for Notorious B. IG, at least the AI version that is. And as much as diehard fans may fight against the artistic demolition of their favorite artist catalog, the potential profits are just too high for labels to not pursue utilizing AI in this way. If someone is willing to listen to it, and people definitely are, especially with already popular artists, the label will release it. So with that being said, it is clear that the rise of posthumous albums as of late is a dangerous game that is nothing to be toyed with. It is and will continue to be exploited for pure profit to feed the immense demand for deceased artists unreleased music, even if it was created by AI it seems. But we must not forget the ethical concerns surrounding what the musicians who actually created the music 
would have wished for their public catalog and legacies after they die. Perhaps more artists will stand against it with the likes of Tyler the Creator and Lil Uzi Vert, or simply rid their initial record deals of the death clause to mitigate any of these possibilities. Only time will tell.